I'm going to breeze through this, hopefully, kind of give you guys the state of what we're doing in stroke intervention. Uh, like a, a lot of things in medicine, uh, things are very pendulous, uh, and uh, we're at one full swing of the pendulum at this point. There's our, my financial disclosures, and since um, COVIDian does uh, make medical products uh, that are for stroke intervention, I'm going to try to make this as unbiased as possible. Uh, standard DOD disclaimer. First endovascular stroke, like organized RCT for stroke, uh, as you guys may or may not know, PROACT-1 that went into PROACT-2, which was a, uh, the uh, uh, clinical trial uh, looking for outcomes. And just as a quick summary, it showed that outcome in the interventional intra-arterial arm was better than the control arm, which was just heparin. Then uh, mechanical came around with uh, Pierre Gauban at UCLA uh, doing his first study, which unfortunately was not an RCT. It was a single arm study, which is the biggest criticism of endovascular therapy up until IMS3. Uh, and when they pooled Mercy and Multi-Mercy, um, they uh, found that w within the single arm, if they broke up patients into who was uh, recanalized and who wasn't, and the assumption in that case is that the patients that weren't recanalized uh, were the equivalent of medical therapy, which is obviously a false assumption. Um, but when you compared the two, uh, the patients that were recanalized um, uh, did better, uh, had a lower mortality rate, and uh, had a better overall uh, outcome. So the MRS of two, less than two, uh, which is um, a good outcome, uh, was 48% in the patients that were recanalized. Then uh, Joe Broderick, um, put together IMS-3, and over the course of six years, they actually enrolled all the patients that they were intended to. So if you look at the first date, this being 2006, um, that's really when Mercy was the only device out there. So essentially, the first number of patients that were being enrolled were getting Mercy, or they were getting intra-arterial uh, TPA, or they were getting um, uh, the ECOS catheter. Uh, not until the end did the uh, newer generation uh, devices get thrown into the, to the, to the mix. Uh, and so it was kind of an ongoing protocol that was being done. Uh, so they got full dose TPA or they got a bridging dose, which is a two thirds dose TPA, and then the intra arterial therapy. Um, unfortunately in this trial, uh, what they ended up showing is that MRS uh, less than equal to two were equivalent and the 90 day mortality was equivalent. Uh, so this really kind of put the kibosh on any sort of endovascular stroke therapy because this is really the only large randomized controlled trial when people were doing a lot of mechanical thrombectomy and people were saying, why are we doing this if, if, uh, if we're really at clinical equipoise compared to best medical management? <clears throat> So the pendulum went, to, went one way, and this was in 2013, and actually almost about, uh, so this was sort of how everybody in, in stroke was. You know, I, I got to say that it probably wasn't uh, how we were here. Uh, we were fairly selective in patients that we were bringing over, um, and so we knew that there were randomized trials that were in the process of going on at the time, Swift Prime being one of them. Um, and we were really waiting to see, uh, as the RCTs kind of came out, is that really going to be the way uh, of the future? Or was it this dismal way of treating large vessel occlusions? So I'm going to back up a little bit and talk about physiology for those of you um, that don't quite know stroke physiology. And um, this is a, a nice little diagram that shows you all the different things. This is a dynamic process, all the different things that happen at the cellular level. So as you decrease, so everything is kind of going along the, the axis of decreased perfusion. So as opposed to if you take, instead of cerebral perfusion pressure, you just take brain perfusion in a, in a region of interest. Um, and you decrease that perfusion to that territory within that vessel, uh, the, the changes that occur are going to be diagrammed here. So CBV is cerebral blood volume, CBF, as you know. Uh, mean transit time is the overall time in seconds that... Um, uh, uh, the arterial and then the venous phase uh, passes through that, that area of tissue of interest. Oxygen extraction fraction, really ischemia is, this is a little bit overestimation in this terms of this diagram because uh, OEFs, uh, as determined by PET, um, really anything over, the, over 0.6 or 60% of oxygen extraction fraction really means that the, the brain tissue is ischemic. And then the cerebral metabolic requirement of oxygen. So as your CPP comes down, uh, you have a, 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 an area where you have a compensated CBF. And the reason for that, I'll get into in a little bit later, is your cerebral vascular resistance goes down. Your arterioles are maximally dilated, venules are maximally dilated. And so you start getting a slow increase in your CBV, 
uh, but your CBF is fairly normal. Uh, as your CBV gets to the point where it's really struggling, you're still in this phase where you're having benign oligemia. Your CBF is lower, but because your CMRO2 is still matched, you don't actually um, have ischemia at this point. Your oxygen fraction, extraction fraction, your cells are starting to realize, hey, I'm not getting enough oxygen, so I'm going to start extracting a little bit more oxygen until the point where it becomes anaerobic glycolysis. So lactate goes up here, your ATP usage goes down, you're starting to get a little bit of metabolic failure at this point, uh, and then you get into electrical failure, which may be somewhat protective, because this is a lot of, uh, a lot of people that we're seeing that have uh, large, high NIH stroke scales, uh, and you do a, a scan on their perfusion, and they have horrible perfusion, yet they're not actually having stroke yet, these are patients that are actually having uh, cellular failure. Their cellular machinery is not working, but at that same time, that decreases their overall metabolic requirements. So it's sort of like the brain is in some sort of shock at that point. Um, and if you don't, and you, so you have this window up until this point where you can actually reperfuse them. But once they re uh, reach that maximum OEF, they've completely failed their mitochondria. Um, the cells die, and then that's irreversible damage. So really, you're talking about the perfusion downstream of a proximal occlusion. This is really what we're talking about. I'm not talking about lacoons. I'm not talking about tiny little perforating arteries. So time as brain has been this kind of mantra about the, from the American Stroke Association, American Heart Association, but it really is a continuum. And depending, and again, I'm only talking about large vessel occlusions in this, in this talk, uh, there's a, a lot of variability in who can, ha can tolerate more time for their brain, and that has a lot to do with the collaterals. Um, this is just kind of an image that I, I like to talk about. There's, there's still an ongoing debate about what the best way of imaging. You get a lot of spatial resolution with diffusion-weighted imaging that you can see in the same patient. If you do DWI, you see the core of infarct, um, but it's kind of overestimated by their CT perfusion. So you don't actually have good spatial resolution with a CT perfusion, but it's a lot faster. Um, probably the way it's going to shake out is that imaging, uh, to look at the stroke core, uh, is going to be reserved for patients that start getting out closer to the six-hour mark. As you'll see, most of the trials that got revascularized within four hours, um, the, the chances of having a good recovery were very high. So probably there's some degree of interaction with the length of the clot, the length of time the clot is in the vessel, how it adheres to the endothelium, and the degree of the ease of which it's to, to, you can reperfuse somebody. But within four hours, the general population will probably be able to tolerate some degree of um, ischemia, or at least the core of the burden in, in, in um, at least in M1 occlusions, uh, is going to be fairly low. So I'm going to go back into collaterals a little bit. Um, uh, there are a lot of different collaterals. We all mean different things when we talk about collaterals, but uh, the, the general collaterals that we talk about are peel collaterals. But these are the other collaterals that come in play. Um, external to peel collaterals, or EC to IC collaterals, that normally exist, the most common of which um, if you include your ICA, and um, I think Pascal talked about uh, Serbanyenko. Serbanyenko actually, before he started even doing balloon assist, or you know, led into the balloon assist, he was actually doing balloon occlusions just to see what the vascularity would do. Um, and so in this case, this is um, the old Mercy balloon uh, catheter, which is utilized in stroke retrieval. Here's a balloon that's inflated in the ICA, and I put a second catheter. Uh, in the ECA to inject, and you see the external branches, and then what you end up seeing is retrograde flow through the ophthalmic to then reconstitute the ophthalmic artery. So that's the most common EC to IC collateral pathway in a large vessel occlusion, large proximal occlusion. Obviously, that collateral is not going to exist if your occlusion is in the ICA terminus, and it's not going to really help if the occlusion is in the M1. But if your occlusion is anywhere below the takeoff of the ophthalmic, that would be one of the ways that collateral, the ECI, the ECA will collateralize the ICA. Occipital artery, the vert artery collaterals are also very common. If you include vert low enough, the muscular collaterals, usually at the level of V3, um, will have a fairly large muscular connection with the occipital artery. And so uh, a common carotid artery might get flow, get flow backwards from the vert to the uh, occipital or vice versa if you included the vert origin. Communicating arteries, uh, a lot of variation. Who has communicating arteries? So um, this is a, a, a patient that actually has a balloon, uh, not fully occluded because you can see a little wash out there, but a uh, balloon in the right ICA. You inject the left ICA, you see cross-filling of the contralateral ACA, uh, retrograde flow out the A1 to the ICA terminus, and then out to the MCA territory. Uh, and you can see that the parenchymal phase is really only delayed about a second. 
And this patient with, if you take down the right ICA, will probably do okay. Um, so, you know, anything about within one second of where you can actually get to the watershed zone uh, or that parenchymal phase in that watershed territory will most likely uh, be viable. So peel collaterals, I'll spend a little bit more time here on peel collaterals. So these are what I uh, mentioned, describe the, or at least define the cerebral vascular resistance. And when you have a normal cerebral vascular resistance between two points of CPP, usually between anywhere between 60 and 90, you're actually having a fairly sta uh, uh, stable cerebral blood flow. Uh, and that's because the arterioles are maximally, uh, maximally dilated when the CBF, the CPP is low to maintain that CBF. And the resistance goes up and those arterioles become very small as the CPP gets higher. And uh, eventually when you get beyond this point of compensation, you have breakthrough um, perfusion uh, or hyperemia, and then you have oligemia, and then eventually infarction on the, the low end. And that really is a definition of what we challenge with CO2 in terms of vasomotor reactivity. And these lie on the peel surface. So here's some images of uh, peel collateral. So this may actually look like a normal uh, ICA injection, but as you guys uh, hopefully learned from my first lecture, uh, you should be able to see a bunch of insular segments, a bunch of M2 branches. But what you don't see is this uh, you don't see them because all you have here is essentially the vessel coming out to the sylvian fissure, and actually this is supplying the temporal lobe. So you actually have an infrasylvian M2. That's the only thing that's patent. This, uh, the majority of the supersylvian MCAs come from this one branch, and you're not seeing them. So as you march this out, the ACA to MCA collaterals are going to be fairly obvious. So these will come from that medial frontal candelabra I talked about anteriorly, and then these uh, prefrontal and the frontal branches uh, more posteriorly will come across this watershed zone, and then you'll start seeing retrograde flow down into the normal MCA territory. So those are the peel collaterals of the ACA to the MCA. And the vice versa would occur, obviously, if you had an ACA occlusion and you didn't have an ACOM, the MCA would, might be able to f uh, fill it backwards. This is a, a little bit different. This is actually a um, patient with Moya Moya, and I'm actually, this is a good illustration of both PCA to MCA as well as PCA to ACA collaterals, peel collaterals. Um, one of the variables that I didn't talk about on the PCA, um, uh, commonly um, um, Osborne talks about the uh, inferior temporal artery, which is a singular branch, usually coming off the the P2 segment of the PCA it goes courses along the inferior aspect of the of the uh, temporal lobe, uh, and that is what this person has. So they actually have PCA uh, supplying this inferior temporal branch. Some uh, Netter talks about um, anterior, middle, and posterior, but I tend to, in normal anatomy, you tend to see more of it just one singular dominant inferior temporal branch. So here in this Towns view, because this person actually has no MCA, this person actually is moi moi, and they actually have bilateral ICA occlusions. Pay attention to this MCA, essentially the vessels will come up inferiorly in the temporal lobe, collateralize backwards into the MCA, which would normally have a watershed zone over probably the, the medial temporal gyrus. Uh, and then you'll get blood flow backwards into the sylvian fissure and then antegrade. And I'll show you a lateral view of that. Here are those temporal branches coming out, supplying the inferior aspect of the temporal lobe first, then superiorly, and then actually even a temporal polar branch. And then you start to see the sylvian vessels, and there's that sylvian uh, triangle that I talked about. Likewise, the same thing's happening in the ACA. So over that splenial collateral zone, uh, the mesial uh, branches usually that arise from the P1 segment, they'll actually collateralize over the splenium of the corpus callosum. And you can see this tiny mesh of arterial or network that then pr produces flow in the pericolosal artery backwards all the way until you actually start seeing callosal marginal or um, the, where the highest demand of blood flow is, so even out into the medial frontal branches of the ACA. Okay, so, so why has this... Has, why has this pendulum switched, uh, uh, swung back? Well, it, it turns out that the biggest, you know, as a group, um, neurointerventionalists said, well, you know, IMS3 is so flawed because, first off, they were enrolling people that didn't necessarily have occlusion. A significant percentage of people did not have occlusions, and they were randomized into this trial. In addition, when you look at the breakdown of the, the people, the number of people that actually had next generation devices, it was a very minority of patients. So um, we really have first generation, which we're really just talking about mercy and you know anecdotal cases of other devices. 
and then second generation devices that came out that were somewhat improved and actually um, uh, Cameron's group uh, uh, was uh, important in the Penumbra trial, uh, which was really the first generation of Penumbra was really a next generation type of device. And now we have the newer, the newest generation and hopefully we'll continue to evolve uh, as we go. So A through E does really not define the, the generation types, but uh, the alligator uh, by chestnut really kind of a foreign body retrieval device, a couple ca um, case reports about how that was able to extract a clot. Micro snare has been reported as, as clots, but again, this is before any sort of randomized trial. This is the um, first generation Mercy, and actually as, a, as time went on and right around the time this penumbra catheter, aspiration catheter came around, they made some adjustments to it, but it, it essentially is still a device that you have to go through the clot for uh, and pull distally, so it's a, it's a, it's a uh, retriever that engages from the distal end, as opposed to the aspiration catheter, which really engages from the proximal end. So each of those has uh, inherent in, in, uh, advantages and disadvantages. And the newer generation of stent retrievers, which really came around from, uh, from the European usage of uh, solitary, um, which was an aneurysm bridging device, which is uh, a lot like the flow models that you guys were playing with today, where you pl place the stent temporarily, help bridge it. You know, you had still bypass flow, so you didn't have the disadvantages of balloon. Uh, and then you had the option of either leaving the stent in if you felt like you needed it or withdrawing that stent. So Solitaire, made by uh, Covidian at the time, uh, then decided, well, we can use this actually and not let it detach and see if it engages the clot further. So much like Mercy, at least in this, um, in this technique, both the stent retrievers that are out there, one by um, Medtronic and one made by uh, Stryker, they both sort of in, in, incorporate the clot. And essentially what you end up seeing is as you cross the clot and then unleash the stent retriever across the clot, you usually see the, the clot being eccentric. So it pushes the clot to the side. And by allowing some flow, you're actually giving some sort of temporary bypass. You're probably breaking some of those fibrin cross links um, that have developed across the endothelium. And uh, by producing that extra amount of flow, it may be dislodging the clot from the endothelium. Uh, and that's, uh, in theory, how it starts, the interstices start to engage the thrombus. So here's a patient that we, uh, we treated maybe about a couple years ago. Um, uh, and as you see, when uh, this was the story, she was actually fairly young. The story is that uh, a week prior to showing up and being transferred to our hospital, she had been um, uh, on a, in one of those um, floaters towed behind a boat, got thrown a couple times. She remembered you know, getting her neck torqued uh, and feeling kind of bad and having a really bad headache, but she had so much fun she continued to do it. For about a week or so afterwards, she just felt malaise, neck pain, malaise, didn't feel great. And one day, woke up, couldn't move part of her body. Uh, she, had, she started having right hemiparesis, uh, tried to pick up the phone to talk to her mother and couldn't get any words out. I think her NIH stroke scale was something in the 15 or 16 when she came in. When you injected the right ICA, just till we were doing the mapping of exactly what was going on with her, um, she has a huge ACOM, huge A1, but the blood flow stops right there. And as you go on further, it still stops there. So the clot is actually not only into the ICA or into the A1 segment, it's affecting the MCA because here is the left A2 segment and distal ACA tree. And you can see those leptomeningeal collaterals with ACA to MCA collaterals that I talked about. So you know from this injection that not only is there something wrong with A1, but there's something wrong with the M1 at least. So most likely this was an ICA terminus occlusion. Well, it turns out it's a little bit more complicated than that because Here's that ICA terminus occlusion. Um, we were able to get one of our catheters to kind of sneak by, and you see all these filling defects in this very patchless looking vessel. And you know, based on the story, fairly clear that she had a dissection in an artery to artery embolism. So these are actually very difficult to deal with. Um, and knowing the, all the different tools in your toolbox is very important because obviously, using a, a distal type of retriever like the old Mercy, if that was the only thing available, it'd be very difficult to get any sort of catheter all the way up to have a balloon occlusion. You can't get it past that dissected segment. Likewise, any sort of stent retriever would be fairly difficult because if you're going to get into the intracranial circulation and pull it down, you're going to be pull it down, pulling it down each and every time across this dissection uh, and then have to potentially navigate it past. So you needed something that you can sneak past the dissection because she's the most symptomatic. She obviously has had this dissection for a week. She's symptomatic now because of this intracranial occlusion. So you have to deal with the intracranial occlusion. Uh, that's the most important thing, and that's what's making her symptomatic.
So uh, this actually doesn't show a uh, little bit of work that we did first. Here is our actual uh, sheath. So we actually have a six French sheath going all the way from the groin up into the neck. Uh, and then we have an intermediate catheter. In this case, it was an aspiration catheter. So we've actually snuck it past uh, um, uh, most of the dissection through what we think was a true lumen. So now your intermediate catheter is all the way out into the, the, um, the uh, petro, uh, petro segment of the ICA. And we injected it. And we've confirmed that we're in the true lumen. And then you through that, you take a microcatheter, uh, in this case, um, an O2-1 type of catheter. You get out into the distal MCA tree. You can see there's a little bit of filling defect there, which was going to be a problem as well. But once you get your catheter out there and you have the support, so you have a proximal support of the shuttle, you have a, uh, or the sheath, and you have a microcatheter fairly, fairly distal out, you can then take that intermediate catheter, in this case, like I said, an aspiration catheter, all the way out. So I've now had have a catheter that's an 061 uh, inner lumen ready to aspirate. And you can see how big that catheter is. It's almost the entire size of the M1 lumen. Here's my microcatheter out to here, and you can see here's some thrombus. And I've deployed a uh, stent retriever, which will remain unnamed. But here's the distal aspect of that stent retriever, and the stent retriever comes all the way down to the microcatheter. Here's another bit of clot here. So there was actually three different clots. We have a distal one out into the M2. We have this proximal one that's in the ICAT that probably extends out into the M1 significantly, and then down low. So it's really three tandem different uh, occlusions. So you know, really, in this case, we wanted to go distal to proximal. So we have the stent retriever across here. We're already positioned with some sort of aspiration catheter here. Uh, and this technique has been described as a salumbra technique, where you're using a solitaire or any sort of stent retriever, uh, and you're pulling it into a aspiration catheter. And then this patient is really ideal because we don't have to traverse that dissection. We traverse it once. We have our receptacle here. So if we can pull everything down into here and then establish intracranial flow, you're, you're good. And then you can deal with the dissection later. Uh, and fortunately, after, I believe, two pulls, after we went for the distal one first and then came down into the ICAT, you can see here's my aspiration catheter again down lower in the petrous segment. Uh, and microcatheter is still there, uh, but I've established that I have good anti-grade flow. The inter intracranial circulation is complete, uh, and then you can deal with the dissection at that point. About a year now, uh, in Turkey, they, uh, the Dutch group... Uh, unveiled their randomized trial. And this was the first of, of four, five trials now that I randomized that showed a positive benefit for uh, endovascular therapy for acute uh, large vessel occlusion. So I'll spend a little bit more time about this. So this was done in the ne Netherlands, multi-center. This is a national healthcare system. It was very easy for them to, to get the 600, 600 or so patients. Um, they're fairly uh, liberal in who they brought in. So they actually brought in patients that were both TPA eligible and TPA ineligible. So if you were able to get TPA, you still got TPA. If you weren't, you still got randomized to best medical management or endovascular therapy. Uh, and so they got close to 500 patients. So I'm, I'm wrong, 500 patients. Uh, and the two overall groups were about the same. And what they found was that if you had control, if in the control group, this 32% of people actually had any sort of recanalization in 24 hours. That's significantly different from IMS3. IMS3 showed patients that were, you know, they were close to 60 or 70% with just medical management, which is not really what we see with people with large vessel occlusion. TPA just doesn't circulate in those patients. Um, and this is much more close on par to what we see in, in, in medical management when people don't, don't get thrombectomy. TIGI 2B, TIGI is a score, um, uh, uh, thrombolysis in cerebral ischemia, it really shouldn't be called thrombolysis, but it's um, a score that gauges, after you're done with your thrombectomy, how much blood flow is there. 2B really uh, requires you to have at least two-thirds of the territory that was blocked recanalized. 3 is a complete recanalization. And that number is significantly higher than uh, if, I, if you were to back up to Mercy, the numbers were about 30%. So the recanalization rates in this newer technology, these newer generations of, of devices, is significantly higher. Still not perfect, and you'll see uh, there's probably some relationship to the a length of time it takes before you actually recanalize them. So they actually did what's uh, uh, an ordinal shift analysis, and, and all of these trials have actually looked at ordinal shift analysis. So it's no longer dichotomizing. It's really hard to dichotomize people and get statistical significance when you want to look at people that are two, two and less, and then three and greater. 
right? So you actually have to have reach a, a higher margin to show that. But if you can show that you've shifted people, so people from sixes have gone to fives, fives to fours, et cetera, by your, by your intervention, it might be a little bit easier to show. And that's what they showed, uh, that you're 60% more likely to have a shift to a better MRS. Now, that doesn't mean that you're going to be independent. It may mean that instead of being dead, you're vegetative. That's not necessarily a good thing. But the overall shift pattern is towards a lower uh, MRS. And that was significantly, uh, signif statistically significant. Um, and then a whole, the, the whole deluge came out. So this is really where the pendulum came back. So Swift Prime, Escape, Extend IA, Revascat, which I haven't shown. This, most of these came out in ISC uh, in February. Uh, and that is mostly because after MR Clean, Mr. Clean came out, it was thought that it was unethical to withhold thrombectomy. So all the trials that were on, in the process of being done, they had to be closed uh, and, and analyzed. Unfortunately, the data, the numbers that they enrolled uh, showed all across the board that it was statistically significant. So here's Mr. Klein, which was the, lar the largest of them. Uh, Escape done in Canada, which also looked at some um, parametric imaging uh, of CT scans. Um, Extend IA, Swift, Extend IA was the smallest of them. Swift Prime was actually uh, uh, funded by Covidian. It was essentially only solitaire devices. And then Revascat, like I said, which was done in Spain. Uh, and all of these actually looked at um, uh, MRS as a shift analysis. Uh, but this was actually, I believe, a dichotomized outcome. When you look at these numbers, and I think this might actually be my last slide, um, the, the interesting numbers is that these tiki 2 b and 3 in the thrombectomy arms were, were lower in MR clean, but they actually got to patients a lot later in MR clean. So uh, I think I cut out that slide, unfortunately. MR clean, the average was something like 300 minutes or close to 300, 280 minutes. These three trials, which show really, really high revascularization numbers, these are really good numbers. All of those patients were recanalized from time of onset of stroke to time of revascularization within about four hours, about 240 minutes. So there probably has something to do with the amount of time the clot has been embedded in there and the amount of fibrosis and interaction with the endothelium that allows for that clot to even be retracted, so this, the extracted. So the sooner you get to it, the more likely you're going to be able to open it, which also correlates with the more tissue viability that's likely uh, still occurring. Uh, all of these odds ratios were significant, and uh, you know Jeff Saver, being the person that he is, he always likes to talk about number needed to treat. And so his estimate is close to three patients. Every three patients that you take to end thrombectomy uh, is going to have a significant uh, improvement in their odds ratio. And then if you look at just dichotomized, which is a secondary outcome, um, they're actually having fairly good numbers. Sixty percent of people are having having a good outcome. I think that is my last slide. So that was stroke in a very, very quick nutshell. Mm -hmm.